You uh, you mentioned experimentation. I'm curious what your take is. Uh, so you're a startup. You don't really have a lot of experience to begin with, and then you're uh, now you're throwing experiments uh, into the mix. How long do you think that a founder should stick with an experiment before they uh, decide to, to to pivot, for lack of better terms? Yeah. So I think there's kind of two phases of experimentation. One is like when you think you have enough volume or you do have enough volume to get to a level of statistical significance, right? And this is like, when you talk about A-B testing and a lot of what the the high growth startups, the mostly Silicon Valley based high growth, high funded startups are doing, that's not really what I'm talking about, right? So, so that stuff is all um, uh, relatively straightforward to run statistically significant experiments through platforms like Firebase or Optimizely, some of those other things. The experimentation that I'm talking about, at least in a lot of our programs, is kind of experimentation in air quotes. And what I mean mm -hmm. by that is that when you're just kind of getting started, again, building those feedback loops are like really, really, really critical. You, you have to try different things in different ways to try to be relevant to an audience. And, and so you might have launched a product or a minimum viable version of a product or a service, and you've got it out there and, and you're trying to market towards it and you just, nobody cares, right? It's time to switch it up or, and that would be an experiment, try different messaging, build a um, totally different set of calls to action. If you've got a problem, for example, with conversions, let's say you're able to kind of get people to your website, but you know, a 10th of 1% of them are, are, signing up for the free trial of your product will make it easier, show more value. Again, change the messaging. If you've got people signing up for a free trial, but none of them are converting or very low percentage of them are converting, run experimentation with the onboarding. Try to pick up the phone and call them. Send them a personalized email. This is the stuff I'm talking about, right? right. So if anybody signs up for Growth University right now, chances are uh, they're, go they're gonna get some automated messaging. They're gonna get their onboarding stuff, right? But I'll look at the profile. We're still small enough where I will look at the profile. I'll go to their LinkedIn and I'll send them a personalized welcome email. It might be two sentences. It might not happen instantly, but I'm trying to create a dialogue and build some engagement between myself and the founder because we're a relatable brand, right? We're, we, we're trying to be normal operators who are accessible, who have these playbooks to help founders with. So the level of experimentation that I'm talking about is is more directionally based, right? So if some stuff isn't working, keep iterating by running different stuff, put different messaging, put different onboarding, try different channels, try different advertising. Well, if all you, those stuff all could of be working stuff. too. You could just be the wrong audience. Right? It could I be the wrong audience. That, most people quit and they're like, oh, well, you know, I asked, I remember we invested in a company once. This like, oh God, this, so it's gonna hurt to this. <laughs> he literally had one conversation with someone who was like yeah they don't want it and he's like i'm throwing in the towel and i'm like are, uh, you, are, you, are you serious like he's like yeah i went to vegas for this event paid for by us by the way and um you know who it is tim too so i, I like <laughs> i like i was like dude like you asked one person he's like yeah they gave me feedback and they're like i'm done i'm like that th this is a long game like it's a long you, game. You have no idea who you are. No. And I think most people just like, they're like, ah, I, I'm not there yet. And I'm like, yeah, you, yeah, you are not there yet, which is why you have to continue to do this a little bit more, like, and more to, like, and it, more and more. Yeah. I mean, I mean, to business. I mean, you know, Tim wasn't there yet to be for Boston qualified this year. He did it five years later. He finally got there. He got that big yeah. moment. Like it, these are it's, the things that you have to learn. Like it's, yeah, I, I tell this quick. story like when I, before Growth University was a thing. So I didn't, unlike Jason or, or, I mean, you guys have a pretty good audience, right? Nobody knew who the heck I was. I was like a behind the scenes operator. I've grown a bunch of companies, right? But nobody really knows who I am because I wasn't out there on Twitter. I mean, a little bit, I mean, here and there, but I never spent time building my own audience. Um, and part of that is because I often felt like I didn't really have anything to say or I didn't know what to say. And then I realized like, it kind of doesn't matter. You just need to get started. But when I sent um, the first email for the, what was the predecessor to Growth University, there were like 25-ish people on my email list. I mean, that's it. 
right? And it was embarrassing. And I had to go through the whole same process that we go through right now to write a really good email. I had to go through it then, but it was to like 20 or 25 people. It might've been fewer. And it, probably five of them were my, my own test accounts. But like, I did it. It was embarrassing. Like looking back on it, it kind of feels funny to talk about because there were so few people who cared at all. But if you go through that and you grow it slowly and then next time it's 40 and then it might be 50 and then maybe a LinkedIn post does really well and you get people to your site and some of them sign up and then you post something again and you get more slowly, you build it up over and over time. Um, that's what it's all about, right? And I think the same holds true with your startup. Um, if you talk to a customer and the customer says, hey, I hate what you're doing, well, go learn from that, right? Go talk to 100 more customers and maybe 10 of them love what you're doing and 90 hate it. You got to build a thick skin though. Like it's just, this is not for people who are going to be easily offended or who are just going to get knocked down. Like you got to just kind of keep getting up to a point. Like I do think you can go too long, you know, and maybe there's situations where you should give up, but I'd say 95% of the time you got to kind of just keep getting up and pushing on it. Well, I think that's the Holly. I think your embarrassment aspect of that is just the Hollywoodification of, right. mm, I was just of, about of the to world, say that. right? And so it's like, you know, people are like, Oh, how big is your email list? <laughs> I mean, we're not in the locker room. Like why are you asking me that question? Like type of thing. Like it's, Oh, maybe that was a bad analogy, but like, <laughs> I, I don't understand why people like are like, how, why does that matter? Like, yeah. Oh, my, my email list is, you know, 7,500 people. Okay. Well, if four people open that email right. and that's it, then my email list is really four. Mm. Total vanity metric. Right. Yeah. And, I, and I do well, think the Hollywoodization think lot, of it is there's a lot of vanity metrics out there. Right. What do you think is the biggest? Of vanity, what do you think the think biggest uh, vanity metric is? Biggest vanity metric? Probably website views. I just don't think I. Yeah. Go ahead, Zach. What are, well, I think oftentimes raising capital, the, the capital raise is a vanity metric. I think capital raise is a huge vanity metric. Yeah. 100%. Well, I, I don't think most founders who raise that much capital know what to do with the capital. And that's part of the game. That's I literally part of the asked someone game. yesterday, like, oh, I'm ra raising money. I'm like, oh, for what? I don't know. Oh, my God. But even companies that have some sense of pre-product market fit. I mean, right now in this market, they're raising these insanely huge rounds. And I'm like, what are, what are 50 new hires going to actually do? Right. What are they actually going to work on? Like, there's something to be said about hiring really talented people and kind of keeping it a little bit leaner for a little while until you hit product market fit. And then you've got specialists that you pull into scale. I mean, we're not there, right? right. We're super small, but I think capital is a huge vanity metric. And um, and unfortunately, I think that that is, it's one of those things that gets a ton of visibility. So startup X raises X amount of money. Everybody thinks it's, you know, they're successful, but in, in, in founders often, I mean, I remember even maybe as long as maybe 10 or 12 years ago, I actually thought if you raise a bunch of money, you're rich. No. <laughs> doesn't work that way. You raise capital and you put it, put it to work in the company. So there's, there's just so many, um, uh, you know, aspects that are just kind of off base with the whole capital in the hot market right now. It absolutely can be the right thing for the right company. Totally. But yeah, it's, it's oftentimes, it, I think it's attributed it, to the wrong stuff. I mean, the toughest job I ever had was in a situation where the company was overcapitalized and had horrible retention. And it was basically my job to figure out how to fix that problem. It's really hard to fix that problem. It was the two things, retention was terrible and customer acquisition costs were insanely high because the company was literally advertising everywhere, right? But, but, but the product, it was like crickets. There's nobody using it, but they raised a ton of capital. So that's interesting. So our area, the Virginia Beach region, historically, people will say the biggest issue is, is there's not enough people that will fund a business. Yeah. Right. So, and then the businesses that are looking to get funded, they're not actually willing to do any of the stuff. Mm. I'm generalizing this, but they're not willing to do any of the stuff that's necessary to actually acquire even your first customer. Yeah. So it's really interesting to just, to just, you know, continue to hear stuff like this because it's like, well, you don't even need money. You 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 think you need money to be successful when it's like you weren't even willing to like 
post on your your Facebook page, hey, I opened a business and you might be a customer. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. This, I, is like... it, this, this is what kind of drives me crazy, right? And I, and I actually built a program called Finding Your Initial Customers specifically to help solve for this problem because again, the as founders, as people who love to build products, um, we are really good at execution. Like we get in the weeds, we build stuff, we launch stuff, but oftentimes we're not actually talking to customers, right? And I love hearing stories. I love meeting founders, even if it's been really bumpy for them and they've been at it for a year. But if they've gone and they've already burned through their friends and family to use their product and they've tried to, you know, interrogate people at coffee shops to get them to use their product and they've spent a little bit of money on paid ads and they're and their guest, you know, speakers on podcasts and they're going to conferences and they're uh, they're they're advertising and they're marketing, that's a sign of a founder that's doing the work. To, to try to validate their business versus somebody who maybe a second time founder or a third time founder, maybe somebody that was successful, gets the money and tries to bypass that step. And then often what they realize is that there's no skipping that step of customer discovery. There's no skipping the step of like, like problem solution fit first. Like you have to do problem solution fit and then you have to do, uh, you know, there's the persona fit and then there's the problem solution fit and then there's channel fit and then there's like product market fit and you have to kind of go through those steps linearly and there's money can accelerate that process but it it won't fix a retention problem it won't fix a wrong market problem it won't fix a bad timing problem it won't fix a bad team problem i mean this fixes a lot of stuff right like I, the way i met tim originally is he reached out to me not via phone i don't think he called me but he emailed me <laughs> and he reached out to me and said hey you want to meet you know, and I'm, 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 I just got out of my career and at, at wherever Booz Allen, I guess. Um, yeah. uh, and I, I've seen you somewhere and, or, or is introduced by someone and, and, and he actually, you know, reached out directly, mm. which is still very powerful. And I, and I think a lot yeah. of people aren't willing to do that uh, because they don't have the network effect that they want. Right. right. It's easy when you're the rock and say, go buy my tequila. Totally. Right. But you don't, most people aren't the rock. Is that the so rock you, behind you, you, by the way? Of course it's the rock behind me. Come on. Come on. Best in the game. Hey. But I mean, there, there's difference. You, you, you don't have a network. Okay. So then you can't use the network effect. Right. Or you don't have a large network. There's effect. no network you can't effect. Just go yeah. to the, right. You, you, so you have to do something else. That means you have to control it. Pick up the phone. Like, mm. don't just write emails. Right. If Tim yeah. would have not emailed me that day or if he emailed me and I didn't respond, you know, he would have to try a different channel to yeah. get out and people or try to... again yeah, or reach out again. again. That's becoming even more important with kind of the um, diversification of channels too, right? So like if you talk to a lot of founders and you say, well, tell me about your activation strategy. Well, I sent an email when they signed up for my free trial. How many did you send? How else did you get in touch with them? Are you remarketing to them? It's so hard to capture somebody's attention. And it's harder to even keep that attention. And I think part of the problem is just like our craziness with the device and constant yeah. interruption. So you really have to build that comprehensive, you know, multi-channel kind of that holistic view. Um, and again, I think that's what separates some of the fast growing startups from the ones that are maybe struggling are that, you know, you're kind of told to focus on one thing. You can really only focus on one thing though, when you know what that one thing is right. that's going to work. And at Growth U, we're still figuring that out. Like email works well for us, but situations like this where I'm interviewed, these work well for us. Um, speaking engagements work well. Webinars work well for us. And a bunch of other stuff doesn't work as well. But you found that yeah. out. We're, yeah. we're still finding that out. As someone who's been directly involved within the startup community for almost a decade, I want to talk to you about a serious pain point. Spending a ton of time trying to understand the business landscape in the 757. That's time that should be focused on growing the business. At Startwheel, we're here to help you by compiling all of the news you need to know about in one place. Now there's no need to search multiple websites. Just head to startwheel.org and see for yourself. That's startwheel.org.